Welcome to One Minute and 43 Seconds, a true Unsolved Mysteries podcast. I'm your host, Megan, and I'm back with my good friend, Soheeb. Hey, everyone. Today, did I already say it's episode three? Not yet. This is episode three, and today we're talking about one of my favorite cases. It's weird to say it's a favorite because these are tragic things that are happening that we're talking about. But this is a case that I've been interested in a long time, and that's the, dis- the disappearance of Edward and Stefania Andrews in 1970 in Chicago. So a local mystery. And it's one that has intrigued me for a while because I found it while looking on a database called The Charlie Project. And if you're not familiar with The Charlie Project, it's a database with thousands of of missing persons cases and there was one summer I remember that I was I spent all my spare time on this website and I came across this case um, and I always thought it was very interesting because it was from Chicago and it was just so mysterious and there's not a lot of information available Uh, it's not really a covered case so without further ado I guess I'll go ahead and get into details of it So Edward and Stefania Andrews were a couple. Um, They had been married for six years in 1970 at the time of their disappearance. Um, They had both been married previously. I think... She also mentioned they were in their 60s. Correct, yes. uh, They were in their 60s. I believe they were both 62 years old. Um, So not their first marriage. Uh, Stefania had been married once before, but she had been divorced for over 15 years. And Edward, something I thought was funny is somebody said that he had been married five times before, but then they talked to one of his relatives, and that relative said, I think it's more like six or seven. And I thought that was really funny because it's like your own relative has to estimate how many times you've been married. After the first three, it's just guessing, right? Right. It's like, you know, who's keeping track anymore? Anyway. Um, yeah, so they were they were married for six years. By all accounts, they were a very happy couple, and they lived in Arlington Heights, which is a suburb, a northwestern suburb of Chicago. Yeah, about 40 minutes away from the city. They lived in Arlington Heights, which is like 25 miles, I think, away from downtown, but they both worked downtown in the city in 1970. Um... Stefania worked for a credit reporting agency, and Edward worked for a company called Miller Peerless, which I guess is a manufacturing company. Uh, At this time, he was working part-time. He had worked there full-time, but um, at this point, he was semi-retired, so he was working part-time. So anyway, let's talk about the day of the disappearance. So Edward and Stefania... um, on May 15th, 1970, that's, this was a Friday, they drove downtown from their home in Arlington Heights, as they did every day to work. Um, and everything was normal in the morning, but the first sign that something was a little different this day was that Edward's co-workers, or um, Edward's friends, who he had met for lunch, said that he was ill. Um, And so he met some friends at a Pizzeria Uno. And I tried to look up where this company is that he worked for, and the result I was getting was somewhere in Ravenswood with a different name. It was like R.I. Wait, was it Miller Pearson? Miller Peerless. Oh, Peerless. Yeah, no, they used to be in the city. They're a fire extinguisher company. Yes, yeah. But I couldn't find where the address was, so I was trying to I'm place... I'm they must have had offices downtown for their... That makes sense, because he worked C-suites, in an office. Right, and then the manufacturing is done somewhere else. That makes sense. Okay. Because I was trying to figure it out. Anyway, so that makes sense, that he worked downtown, uh, in an, and I know he did work in an office. Um, so anyway, he went to a Pizzeria Uno for lunch to meet uh, some friends, two of his old colleagues, and... One of his colleagues had said that Edward looked ill at lunch and that he couldn't really eat anything and that he kind of, 
he lit up a cigarette and his face went pale and he, he just couldn't eat. So there was that. And then after lunch, it seemed that he was feeling a little bit better, according to his friend. And he drove his friend to the train station um, and then returned to work. So after that, um, somebody at his company during the workday in the afternoon said that Edward was resting his hands or his head in his hands, um, which would suggest that he was still not feeling good uh, or he wasn't feeling good again. Um, so the next thing we know about the movements that night is that Edward and Stefania had plans to go to a cocktail party at the Sheraton Hotel downtown, and they were going to this party right after work. The party was hosted, sponsored by the Women's Auxiliary of the Beverage Institute, which Stefania was a member of. Anyway, she got these tickets from her supervisor. So they, um, they got to the, the cocktail party at the Sheraton between 5.30 and 6 p.m., so they came straight from work. Um, and then everything was fine for the most part, but at some point during the evening, uh, it sounds like Edward was ill again, or he was complaining of being ill, and he was saying that he was hungry. So if you remember, he didn't eat much at lunch because he couldn't eat. But he could smoke. He could smoke. Well, everybody basically smoked in the 70s, from what I understand. Yeah, just like today. Planes, trains, wherever. So... Edward was complaining of being hungry, and he was looking ill. So at about 9.30, after four hours at the party, the Andrewses rode the elevator down to the parking garage of the building. And this is where things get a little weird, because the parking garage attendant um, and the manager, who was named Ant Anthony Morelli, uh, noticed Edward and Stefania, and they seemed to be kind of staggering in the parking garage. And it was said that they almost had to help them get into their vehicle. The Andrews friends who knew them and their family did not know them to be heavy drinkers. You know, they occasionally drank, uh, but they weren't heavy drinkers as far as anyone knew. So this was kind of strange. Anyway, um, so Edward insisted that he was okay to drive, but as soon as he got behind the wheel, he hit a guardrail, or um, he hit part of the parking garage, and yeah, it was like 10 feet from where they were parked, and after this happened, the parking garage attendant, Morelli, walked over and said that he was in no condition to drive, and at this point... Stefania was in the front seat and it looked like she was crying and she sort of nodded in agreement. Um, but Edward, you know, insisted, which his family later said does not sound anything like him. But anyway, um, after that, he peeled out of the parking garage, turning south in a northbound lane on Michigan Avenue. And that was the last time that either... Edward or Stefania was ever seen again. So their disappearance wasn't noticed right away. They had tentative dinner plans with friends the next day, their neighbors rather, um, and they didn't show up for those, but it wasn't like set in stone. It was more of a tentative thing, so nobody really raised an eyebrow yet. Um, but neither of them showed up for work on Monday, which is the, where people really started to wonder because they were both conscientious people and responsible. If they were going to miss work, they would definitely have called and said so. So at some point, Stefania's company and Edward's company communicated that neither of them had showed up and somebody had contacted Stefania's brother. And he immediately called the police and requested that they search their home or do a welfare check on the couple. So they did, um, and everything seemed completely fine at the house, uh, but they, they noted that it looked like the couple hadn't been back to the house since Friday morning. They had newspapers and mail kind of piling up at their house. Um, they had breakfast dishes out still, 
and everything else was there and in order. Um, the only thing that was missing was the clothes that they were wearing that day, and everything else was in line. So now the police are on the lookout for these guys. They're doing a full investigation. Yes. Because they're missing people. And I should mention that it wasn't just Edward and Stefania that disappeared, but their car has never been located either. And that was a 1969 Oldsmobile. Not a real loss. <laughs> Black and yellow Oldsmobile. Yeah. And um, what? You got a problem with Oldsmobiles? And black and yellow, yeah. Anyway. I mean, the only car that looks good black and yellow is Bumblebee. Okay. Anyway, um, so the police were on the lookout for the couple, but also their car. So they put out an alert nationwide for the car. Um, but this is the 70s, so there's, correct. There's, no, there's not many cameras around. There's actually no cameras at toll booths and stuff. And Well, sure, but I guess if somebody had seen, if any police officers had seen this vehicle. If it had done a crime. True. Or, you know, they're out patrolling and they spot it, I guess. Well, no. I mean, two white people in a car, not many Yeah, but they have the make and model of the car. Right. So as long as it's not committing a crime, I don't think they're going to care about it. Plus, how many other cars are being called in as, hey, look out for this car? Like, if cops were actually looking out for every car they had to look out for, they'd do nothing else because cars are where most crimes are committed. I suppose. Number one accessory to crime. I suppose so. (laughs) <laughs> so, another interesting fact about this case is that between the two of them, Edward and Stefania, had 14 credit cards. And when I saw that, I my jaw dropped because one credit card is too much for me to handle. Yeah, I thought it was crazy too. But then it, it made sense when, when we learned that in the 60s, like up until the 70s, credit card companies would just send out credit cards with no rhyme or reason and expect you to pay for them later. And that only ended in the 70s when they got some credit regulation. Right. I think 1970 um, was the year they actually actually put their foot down on this and said this was no longer a practice that people could do. So, um, but By then, so many people already had so many credit cards, even though not many places took credit back then either. That's because, true. Because, you know, you had to have the carbon pay, like... Credit cards were not as instantaneous as they are today, right? Mm -hmm. Machines we have today didn't exist until, like, the 90s. Yeah, that's that's another crazy thing to think about. That's true. Carbon copy. You put that credit card in that carbon paper stack thing, and you roll it over with that other press, and you make a copy of it. Yeah. Crazy times. It's so interesting to think about that, too, because, I mean, I was born in 1989, and... Growing up in the 90s is when, you know... Things are digital things, already. Exactly. So just imagining, like, they didn't have cell phones when they were driving. They didn't have GPS. They didn't have all this stuff. So well, they didn't have GPS, but they had cell phones. Like In the 70s? Oh, no, not in the 70s. Sorry, not in the 70s. In the 90s, that's well, when, yeah. like, the first car phones were coming out. I remember when the and first car phone... We always... We thought... The 80s is when, like, people had car phones and that big old, like... Just the hand receiver style phone. I remember we thought one of our friends in school, it was like third grade, and his mom had a car phone, and everyone was like in awe over it. Like, wow, that's so cool. She has a phone in her car. It was cool. That, that phone cost as much as her car at that time. <laughs> Seriously, yeah. it's, it was super expensive. Now, I mean, that's what happens with technology, right? It gets better and better and cheaper and cheaper. Except iPhones, which stay the same price. Yeah, it's a shame that this technology wasn't available when Edward and Stefania were driving around. But the the reason I bring up the credit cards is because the police um, looked into that and no activity was um, found on any of the credit cards. Or their bank accounts. Or their bank accounts, yeah. So, I mean, whoever or whatever happened, they clearly were not using their accounts and... Nobody, nobody else was using their accounts either. Um, so at this point, the investigation um, ramped up, and the police came up with a theory when they saw tire tracks and um, a spot where it looked like a car could have gone over 
the edge of the bridge, I guess. Run um, off a of Wacker and the river. Yeah, so if you remember, Edward turned south, south in a northbound lane, so he was driving the wrong direction. So the cops thought, you know, maybe after driving for however long, he realized that he made a mistake, and he tried to do a U-turn, but instead he ended up in the river. He was clearly going through something if he wasn't drunk. We'll talk about that more in the theories section, but... Anyway, so they theorized that maybe the couple ended up in the Chicago River. So they did a search of the river. They found, um, they went in and they, what was it? They went in with one of those hooks. Grapple hooks. Grapple hooks, yeah. And um, they thought they felt something metal, but later on it turned out to be just a, what was it? Like, just uh, steel? Like yeah, some random? something that wasn't any... That but not a car. Definitely. Exactly. They looked through the river. They only found, like, what, 12 cars over the years? Yeah, so this but, is... But not theirs. So it's not in the river. Uh, they haven't been heard from since. And Not only did they not find the vehicle as they searched after the disappearance, but in 1980, which is 10 years after the couple disappeared, a general cleanup of the Chicago River produced 12 automobiles. But none of them belonged to Edward or Stefania, Edward and Stefania. So I find that detail in this case really interesting because, first of all, 12 cars in the river. It's Chicago. Like, I don't know what to tell you. It's like, that is a place for cars to end up. If But that's nuts to me. I mean... I mean, drunk drivers go over the railings before... Don't let's they remember, pull the cars out? Let's remember, this is all up until the 1980s, right? So up until then, there wasn't a lot of safety measures. And if at night, where lights were not available as much, stuff went over... Like, those, a lot of those cars must have been really old. True. Or, or That's true purposely sent in there with bodies that no longer exist. So there That's could be ominous. a lot of things. Again, it's... it could be a lot of things. Right. So nothing was found. We, we mentioned that um, the couple was declared legally dead in 1978 um, after nothing was found um, of them. And the next uh, clue or a uh, tip in this case didn't happen until 1994, which was 24 years after their disappearance. And this is a weird one. Um, there was a tipster that told investigators that the couple had been murdered by a gang of young men called the Lake Forest Losers. Which to me just sounds hilarious because growing up in the North Burbs, Lake Forest, they're all losers. <laughs> But they're all like... What if somebody from Lake Forest is listening to this? Then they should know they're losers because they're from Lake Forest. And I'm sorry, Lake Forest. They're all like... I mean, they're super rich a-holes. So the fact that there's a, quote, gang... Uh, yeah. There's a whole bunch of white kids pretending to be tough. Yeah, and I guess what... That's the, Lake Forest. Yeah, and that's what, what I learned about them is that they were uh, middle-class teenagers... And they basically damaged property and harassed elderly couples or elderly people. Right, it's not even a real gang. They're just they're just being assholes. And they kind of wreaked havoc on the area in um, the '60s and early '70s. So, um, anyway, this guy tells the police that he had witnessed the couple be murdered by a gang of young men. And that afterwards, their bodies were placed in their car, and they were dumped in a pond near Green Oaks. Do you know where Green Oaks is? Yes. Lake County? Lake County. So, first of all, why is this guy coming forward 24 years later? Because um, he finally wanted to get some attention? Yeah, so the police actually did search the pond, but this was going to be very expensive. But and, what's really disturbing is that it's really far from everything. Like, well, Green Oaks and Lake Forest are not near where these guys live. Arlington Heights? Yeah, it's not near that. It's like another 10, 15 miles away. Uh, yeah. And that's and that's suburb traffic, not even... Well, like, what I don't understand is... And then it's, all, it's even further from the city. 
Right. What I don't understand about that is how they would have ended up there unless they were taken there. And at that, I mean, they were already in the car. So were they carjacked? I mean, that, I mean, that's one theory, right? Like, it could have been carjacked. It could have been, could have been a lot of, let's finish the story then we can talk about Well, we're basically, that's the thing. So we're basically done. I mean, I think. Right, because they looked through the lake and they couldn't find anything. So there is no proof. Right. So they searched the pond. They found no signs of a vehicle, no signs of bodies. Um, so that's basically where this story ends. And that's the frustrating part because now it's been 50 years and these people are just, have, are just gone. Um, so yeah. Do you want to get into the theories? Yeah. I mean, at the end of it, it's like even more likely than not, they're dead. Now, well, how, now they're dead. No, like right, right after, like I'm yeah. talking in 1970, mm-hmm. they're dead. Like, I'm not even thinking that, like, yeah, 50 years later, of course they're dead. But, right, like, I'm guessing. Guy, like, you know, there's so many theories on this where drunk guy goes the, like, you know, wrong way or whatever else happens. Like, he's either drove into the water somewhere, and it doesn't have to be up there near, like, the, the Michigan Wacker intersection. It could have been anywhere. Like, but as what, where else would be, I'm trying to think, where else along the way would they have gone into the water? Because, I mean, over the bridge is the most, I mean. But there's many, many bridges. True. And not all of them have, like, well, I guess all the other guardrails were okay. Or, the, I mean, they could have driven into, like, just a shitty part of the town and just gotten jacked. That's another theory also that, you know, somebody, somebody, like, took the car, or wanted the car, right, murdered them, got rid of their bodies, and they sold the car for parts. Yeah. I've heard that theory as well. That... Is that worth killing two people over, though? And how, if so, how do you get rid of those bodies? I mean, the worth part is, I don't know. Like, if you want something, you'll do what you think you'll do for it, is the best way I can put it. It's like, I don't know if it's worth it, but it's plausible that... If they were in a neighborhood they're not sure of, or if they ended up in a place where they're not supposed to be, mm-hmm. they could have been carjacked and and killed, and you know, in order to avoid it, like getting rid of a body in the seventies, not the toughest thing, True. if you know where to go or what to do. Like, let's remember, like a tub full of lye can dissolve a body in a couple days. So where? Well, that's creepy that you know that. Yeah, I watch a lot of Blacklist. <laughs> it's a great show on NBC. <laughs> it got a sponsor for us, so you... <laughs> um, so, I don't know if you know this, and maybe I should do more research on this, but what parts of the city were, I mean... Well, it's the 70s, were, right? Were dangerous. Like, was downtown a, a sketchy part? I mean, I know yes. crime can happen Downtown happen was sketchier anywhere. than it is today. Like, this is the 70s, so downtown was pretty sketchy. uh, Most of the city was sketchy. But Edward knew the city. You wouldn't want to be in areas like... Well, you wouldn't want to be in Lakeview all the way to Rogers Park at any time. For people that are listening that aren't from Chicago, that's north of downtown by four miles or so. Ten. Really? Lakeview? Lakeview is like, oh, Lakeview I know like Edgewater's five. like six. Anyway, this this part he's talking about is na- a neighborhood that's north of downtown, and Rogers Park is pretty much the northernmost neighborhood of the city yeah. before you get to the suburbs. So Y'all can look this up on a map, too. Yeah, and I'll and post then, it on Instagram, too, so you guys can see what Chicago looks like and where the hotel was and all that. But... And then, like, yeah, even on the south side, like, you've got Bronzeville not being so great. Like, I mean, it's pretty nice now. And then if you go even further, it just gets worse and worse. Like, I guess Inglewood wasn't as bad. Hyde Park was probably nicer than it is today. Hmm. Yeah. But, yeah, like, the city wasn't, like, there were still lots of crime. And carjacking, especially if you can tell that the guy may not be in his right mind, like, may be drunk or whatnot, pretty easy to steal a car that way. Not to mention, it was tough to track stolen cars in that time. 
because there weren't so many VIN numbers or databases or anything like that. It was like, yeah. you lost your car, well, good luck finding a new one. Like, that was it. Like, there's no database of VIN numbers for parts. Like, they could take this car, take off the plates, chop it, or, like, replace some parts of it and you get away with it. Hell, you might even be able to do a paint job and get away with it as long as you had different plates. Here's what I think. I think it's too... it. I think it's too unlikely that they were behaving so strangely at the party, and then they had, what, this crazy other random event happen to them? I think the most likely thing is whatever was wrong with Edward is what caused their disappearance. So murder-suicide? No. Oh. Where do you get that from? That he was crazy and then No, was... no, no. He was, I think, I think he was suffering from a medical event. Okay. And I think that, first of all, remember, he didn't eat at lunch, right? And yeah. they weren't heavy drinkers, as far as anyone knew. Right. So maybe so he gets to the party. they were secret alcoholics. Maybe. Or maybe he got to the party, and he had an empty stomach. He had a couple drinks, and whatever illness he had, whatever was wrong with him was exacerbated by any alcohol he had. Whatever he was, was wrong with him. So I don't know that he was, I mean, he perfectly well could have been drunk. But the fact that he was sick that day or complaining of feeling sick, I think something was wrong with him. Like he was having a stroke or a heart attack or something that was causing him to act the way he was acting. And I think that would be what caused their disappearance, whether that's they drove off something into the water or something else. But... I just think it would be too convenient for them to be acting as strangely as they were when they left, like how out of character they were, and then for something else to happen, like them get robbed. Then again, I guess you could be more vulnerable when you're in that state. Well, let's also understand that we're getting a lot of this as secondhand, like, like witness testimony is crap. So for the most part, like we're getting this that, hey, yeah, you want me to talk about two people specifically at a party? Sure. Well, do I remember them? Yeah, they were acting weird. No, no, like, no. I'm talking about the parking attendant that right, parking talked attendant to him too. and saw him slam into the thing. Right. So, and then turned the wrong way on so the street. So when you get asked about certain people, yeah, they're always weird because you have to think about it. Like, there is that level of bias. Like, sure, he might have nicked his car, but he might have been in a rush to get somewhere. Maybe... I mean, who knows? Maybe he had a bookie that was looking for him and he had to run. Like, there could be so many different possible options on this. At the end, I mean, the one thing we do know is that their lives as Edward and Stefania Andrews literally ended that day. Because, like, if they did survive, like, on the run, starting a new life, whatever, they weren't them anymore. Yeah. I don't think that's true either because, A, you need money to do that. Like, no I've, matter how you're going to restart, you need some money. I forgot to mention that um, the police and the investigators did confirm with immigration or whatever that they didn't have any visas, they didn't have any passports. Under either. their names. Correct. So, so they, they ruled that out. forged documents. We're talking about a time before, like, computer base, uh, like, databases and stuff. Yeah, but that all sounds like complete garbage. Of course, but anything's possible. Anything's possible, but... But at the end of the day, I think more likely than not, that these guys... Uh, either, I'm going to go with one of two theories. It's either they got jacked, killed, and like disposed of. Like, you know, bodies in the trunk in a junkyard situation. Or... They went over, they uh, they just, like, you know, drove off and died somewhere, like, MIA. Why do you think Stefania was crying? It, the parking attendant said... What makes you think that's real? Well, the parking attendant, that's what the witness said, that when they were leaving, Edward appeared to be sick and maybe, staggering, and the wife was kind of in the front seat just... Maybe she's on with the bookie. Oh, for coming. God's sakes. <laughs> Or, yeah, I mean, it could have been anything. Like, we don't know any of these details. Could have been she's crying because something happened that they now have to run forever. And they're like, nope, we got to leave our lives and just go. 
What are the chances? What could have happened at the party? Where I don't know. I mean, her name is Stefania, so makes me think Russian. Oh, for so the makes love. me think oh, that God. she's got some something to hide. She could have been. I know you don't believe that. Yeah, so. I don't. Yeah, I'm just making crap up because who knows what happened? Like, there's no way to actually get this right. We can just make up whatever. Yeah, but what do you think the most likely thing? The most is? likely thing is that they. Well, I mean. I don't know. That's the other problem, right? There's no real likely thing. Well, I know, I because think it has something to do with his, him being sick and the way he was acting. Well, if he's sick, then go to the hospital. Like, it, like unless something's weird, really weird, right? If he's sick, you would end up in a hospital. You wouldn't end up... But he, in wasn't, a, he wasn't acting rationally. Something was wrong with him. Oh, right, exactly. He wasn't acting rationally. You're, you're something... operating under the assumption that people are always just going to do what's rational. I mean, no, but he may have very well been under the influence of a few drinks and sick at the same time, which would have made him... Who knows? Right, but under that guise of irrationality, like, there's the level of... If he's being irrational, there is still, there's always a grounding factor, right? Like, oh my god, my arm's tingling, I'm having a heart attack, take me to a hospital. Doesn't matter how drunk you are. The irrational part is probably something, like, that just rattled him. Like, you know, maybe, maybe some gangsters are after them trying to kill him because they owe money. That was like, one of the theories. What, that they owed money? No, that they were killed by that gang. Well, that gang, I mean, that could be another part of it. Maybe that's true. Maybe that gang... Or, yeah, I, I get what you're saying. It could have been another gang. It could have been anything. That's the thing. Like, we have no information to go on. Like, Which is the frustrating part of this case, because it's old, and there's not a lot of information. But that's what happens when, when people who live very secluded lives... They was, were they weren't secluded. Semi secluded. They liked going, to entertain. They were going social out to people. entertain is not the same as actually having like a an active family. Neither one of them had biological kids. True. Right. The, yeah, Edward, Edward had, had to had, adopt kids with a wife or a, one of his ex wives, but I don't right. know how close he was with. So them. they didn't have a real family. Either one of them, they were very much like you know together. Don't say they didn't have family because I mean. Stefania's she brother was brother, very active yeah. in the investigation. So, but it's like they didn't have they didn't have that level of tied down Sure, yeah. No, you gotta get what like, you're saying. In the sense that, okay, yeah, I know exactly what they'd be doing on an average Friday night. Sure, like, yeah. They that's true. they were very out of like they were very they're truly like, you know, the Russian sleeper cell family. Oh my god. Like Again that, with the Russia. Yeah, well, the Stefania names really bringing it up, plus, you know, well, you know the times we live in. Uh, they... But the point is, like, you know, there, the lack of information on this case kind of makes me think that it could have been anything. Like, it could have easily been that, yeah, like, you know, let's go crazy crackpot theories now. Okay. Oh, they, No, seriously. He was distressed. They're leaving. Oh, shit. I got to get to... Uh, we got to get the hell out of here. Let's go to the Russian consulate. Russian consulates. You are come. talking crazy. Right I know, now. right? But I, it's not ridiculous. I'm sorry, not Russian. It's ridiculous. This is the '70s. The Soviets. They need to get to the Soviet consulate, which actually isn't in Chicago, so that doesn't work. Even your crazy theory doesn't work. Right, it doesn't crazy work because there was the Soviet Union at the time, and there was no embassy. Here. One other detail I wanted to, I forgot to mention, is that Stefania and, and Edward were planning on retiring this night in 1970. The year that they went missing, they wanted. So to they retire. had a ton of money saved up, and they not a ton, it. but I, I'm from what I've researched, they were comfortable enough where they could retire if they wanted to, and they were going to, or they were planning on it. Right. So, so I mean, to that point, then it's like they are well off, they are set up, but they have very little tied down. Like there's the same reason sure. why no one actually noticed they were missing until they didn't show up to work. It wasn't friends and family who were like, hey. Well, they did miss that dinner the next they, night. But Remember no one, the neighbors? There was a neighbor thing. It wasn't the actual, hey, my friends didn't show up. Oh, something is definitely wrong. It was. Well, something um, was definitely wrong because they haven't no. been seen in 50 years. Well, that's a different problem. But I get what you're saying. You're saying. But nobody... I'm saying is no one actually made a fuss until they didn't show up for work. Sure. Right? So right. that was already the following three Monday. days. Yep. Right? If they were missing on Friday, that's already three days away. Yep. And at that point, 
if no one's looking for you for three days, you can get pretty far in three days. Yeah. Right? Let's. I mean, you could get from here to New York, or but there uh, were, you could get from here to D.C. in three days, in one night, uh, in two days with a few stops for gas. You can get from here to D.C., get to the Russian embassy, or the Soviet oh my embassy, God, if you and Russia get, one more time. get extradited without anybody knowing as diplomats. But they had, okay, they had no passports. In they their had names. no but they had no indication in their house that they were leaving. Right. And somebody so said spies that, don't keep their spy crap at home. They have, they have it all. We have so little information. I can make up any crap I want, and it's just as likely as... It's not just as likely. It's just as likely. It is not just as likely. Really? How is it If not, witnesses saw what? him being sick, or uh -huh. they saw him acting strangely, they saw the like that he increases... Was upset. That increases the likelihood that something maybe no the going symptoms on you on. described like lack of appetite, um, paleness, paleness, irrationality. Yeah, that could be the same thing as being upset versus having a stomach flu. I mean, I guess. So there you go. Like yeah, I guess that's just true. as likely that these guys are Soviet spies that decided to leave. I don't as agree. it is that they died in the river. I do not agree. It is absolutely just it is because weird, we have though. no information. It is weird, though, that the car wasn't located in the river if they were to go overboard. But maybe right? maybe it could have sunk. No, like cars don't sink that Do way. they get into the mud? Like they get sucked into the mud like quicksand and where, like, you know what I mean? Where it's, Well, I mean, if... I had a time capsule once. <laughs> and it was sucked down into the ground because it was all muddy. Yeah, I mean, if there's enough water pressure and like I guess if the soil gives away enough sure but we're still talking about an Oldsmobile in the 60s and 70s mm -hmm. those things were boats like the car was bigger than my living room I shut up say that. No, no. <laughs> but it was twice as the size of cars today like it's an Oldsmobile like we can look this up, and you can see how big this car is. Well, that makes it even more strange, because the bigger it is, the more likely it would be to be spotted, you would think. And the spotted fact that what? it hasn't been... Like, found. What do you mean? Like, we're talking this car. Yeah. Yeah, that thing's huge. Yeah, but... So... That the, makes it even weirder. Well, no, because everybody had those cars back then. These cars would not stick out. They were so what, the is your, what is your point? My point is because of the three-day gap, because of the lack of information, we will never know. We won't. Nor, nor do I think they should have wasted their time on this. After, okay, I'm cutting that out. No, no, seriously. After three years of not knowing what's happening, why did it take all the way to 1978 because a they have years. a family, and they have no evidence of what happened to these people. Exactly. How are they going to declare them dead if they have no evidence of them being dead? They have no. They have no evidence of them being alive. Right. But so you're you, saying why you would need, it take so long? I'm yeah, saying no, you need one or the other. And after a few years, it's like listen, these people still make, mattered. I mean, they yeah, may not yeah. have had they may not have had kids or like the people mattered. But let's talk course. about resources and time and and actual like results. There are none. The right. fact that they just kept but going But they can't on. just not investigate. No, they investigate. But after three years of nothing happening, you're pretty much like, okay, no body, no crime. No, I mean... Like, that's there are really cases, what it comes down to. There are to. cases that have been solved years and right. years, decades right. after. And that's cold case people who decide to go after it and power to them. Yeah, but, but the police the should police, still not give up, I mean. No, the police should give up after, like, a certain amount of time because there's more crime What do you guys think? Now. Do you guys think the police should just give up after a certain amount of time? Yes, because there's more crime happening every day that they should focus on. You're more likely to actually solve murders within, like, or you're so, more likely to solve murders and any crime within, like, the short period that it happened versus... 20, 30 years down. And well, now yes, I agree are, with that. It's less there, likely that it there would be There are solved. certain cases that they do solve decades later because technology caught up and they had some new evidence. Of yeah. Whatever. I'm not saying throw out the box. Save the information you have. Save the evidence. But it should have been a cold case way sooner than it was. Like, the fact that they were actively searching up until, what was that, 1974? No, well, they had they, they had that tipster with the gang tip 
in right. 1994. So, so then that's when you come back to it. Right, but, and they did. But they were looking for the full eight years. It was an open case for eight years. I think I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think, I think that's a waste of time. I don't. I think because then you had your next big break in 1980 when they dredged out the river, and it turned out that was that not there was a big nothing. break. Exactly, but then it turned out, hey, your car is not here. We found twelve others, and then you had your next big break in 1994, which mm-hmm. is a solid 24 years later. Even if they didn't die the day of, they were dead by then. Well, I did think they deserve. I think they deserve to have people looking for them. I get what you're saying about resources, resources, but I just think they deserve. They deserved a good shot, and, and their, family, shot. their family, their family, then they deserves got that shot know. within the first couple of years. If you're not going to find somebody within the first three to, man, well, I'd say three to five years. At that point, it's like, well, how much more time do we devote to this? And there's like, and there was no leads. That's true, right? Except like, for the very few we talked about, right? Like the, those aren't even leads; those are just little anecdotes. All you mm-hmm. know is that these guys took a wrong turn on Michigan Avenue, and they were upset. Which it's not even evidence; it's just hey, it's basically hearsay. It's important though because that's how they were acting the last time they were seen, and then they disappear. But that's was, how people f- say if, they were acting. That's the other but part. What of this. motivation do people have to lie about? No, no, the way it's that not them lying. It's not people lying. It's it's interpretation, right? You may think somebody looks drunk, but really they're just really upset. Or like the dude's not eating lunch because he's sick. Versus, oh, we just had a big breakfast. Who knows? Like, it, like he's having a cigarette, which is a appetite suppressor. Like, there's so many different things going on that. There's a lot of subjective information. So he All was, we really know is that they're missing. He was drunk, or he was ill, or, or both, or he was upset. Yeah. So, or, but something was or not right. Or he was absolutely fine and people just misremembering. Something was not right, though. That's and, Or everything was right, and they got carjacked and were dead. That wasn't right because they turned the wrong direction on the... That was not right. You can argue well, okay, all this so, other stuff, but that so is they not turned right. the wrong direction according to that one attendant. But yeah, why didn't... did this guy lie? No, it's not that he lied. He may not have seen it correctly. Like there could have been a lot of things. Like there's also I don't think there's a big chance that that's went, not correct. If you went the wrong way in Michigan Avenue long enough, a lot of people would see it. I think you just like firing me up. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> it's funny. Okay, but at that, it was 9.30 p.m. I don't know how busy it would have been at that time. It would have been busy enough. Well, no, not in the 70s. Also, somebody, you would think somebody would have seen them go overboard. Maybe not. But right. It's not like the city was empty. Sure. Right? It's still the 70s. It's still Which makes it even more mysterious, the lack of witnesses or whatever. The lack All of people we have who came is the forward. Word. All we have is the word of the, the parking so, attendant. Yeah, exactly. The lack of people who've come forward with any evidence whatsoever. Even but that's like, the thing, oh, I were, saw this car driving, or oh... This car hit me. Like, there's no... There's no anything. Like, if the guy was drunk and he was hitting things like garage doors and... Somebody saw And that. light poles. Like, the, the the railing between the bridge and, like, uh, the river. Mm-hmm. Where the cops said they saw scrapes. Yeah. Are you telling me that no one else saw that? Like, no one else... He didn't hit anything else except those two things. So, what's your point? You're my saying po- that... My point is that there's a lot... There's a lot we don't know. It could have been as simple as... Yeah, they got carjacked and killed. Could've. Or it could be a, you know, they went for, they, uh, what do you call it? They got carjacked and tossed into the river and drowned and died. I don't think that, I just don't think that. I don't think that is very likely that a they were acting weird likely. before they left and then they got carjacked. I mean, that's two abnormal things. Well, again, we're happening. just saying two abnormal things is the fact that the carjacking would be, or the, sorry, the carjacking would be abnormal. But then we're also assuming that there's a fact that they were acting abnormal, right? Two mysterious things happen. But they're not. You're you're trying to keep. You're trying to treat them as cause and effect, when in reality they could be completely isolated. I guess that's and true. The theory it of randomness be. doesn't say that it can't happen. I mean, there's sure. There, there's proof, or there's um, not proof, I guess, but there's actually evidence of one person being struck by lightning twice in the same day. It's not impossible. I'm not saying it's impossible. But I just that's think my point. The most likely you're, you're thing treating is this related. as cause and effect, when in reality, 
Like, him, whatever was happening before has nothing to do with how they died. Or it could have everything to do with how they died. We don't know. That's what I'm saying. I right. think it does. But And I'm saying, who knows? I, if I'm guessing, that's my most likely guess. Okay, well, that's your most likely guess. But then at the end of that, the you, day... You think they're Russian spies, so... They, uh, I mean, it's just as likely as anything else. If they're, <laughs> they're, uh, I, I have to stop saying Russian, because this is the 70s. They're Soviet spies. They could have been from Ukraine or somewhere else. Because it was all part of the Union at that time. That union. I that think union. we're going around in circles a slight Pretty bit. Much. Do you want to go ahead and call it? We can. Do you have anything else you I want to add? Else. I'm, I mean, they're dead. We don't know what's happened. And at this point, 50 years later, we're never going to know what's happened. Well, let me say one thing, though. Yeah. Just before I cut this off, on the off, off chance that anyone ever finds it, they were driving a 1969 Oldsmobile Sports Coupe with Illinois license plate number BB. Nine nine eight six. That's B as in boy. B as in boy. Nine nine eight six. Um, you know it's been fifty years. They. It's been fifty years. But, uh, after twenty years of a non-registered plate, they recycle that number into the system. Okay. Well, they could. If somebody stumbles upon the car, so there's that's probably, the license there's plate. There's probably number. like a a Honda Civic with that license plate right now. Who knows? Well, call it in. Why would you do that? To ask where the hell they got that license plate. From the state of Illinois, because they recycle numbers after 20 years of inactivity. Whatever. So if no one was paying for the tags for 20 years, which would have been in the 90s, um, they would have recycled that number into the system. Look, if you find the car in a body of water oh or gosh. out of a body of water with that license plate... First of all... Okay, yeah, if it was in a body of water, that car would have survived. Like... It'd be rusted like hell, but it would still be in one piece. More likely than not, if the car still existed, it's in a chop shop in pieces. Plus, it's a 69 Oldsmobile. You don't even see a 2009 Oldsmobile, right? Yeah, they didn't go away till 2010. There's no 2009 Oldsmobiles on the road. You're not going to see this. I mean, even in junkyards, you don't see these cars. They're gone. Lord. Well, I think that about does it. Yeah, I mean, I think that covers it. Thank you, Soheeb. Even though we disagree on some things, thank you for being a guest again. Thanks for having me again. This and thank you all for listening. And a reminder that 1 minute and 43 seconds is now on Apple Podcasts. So... You can watch us on YouTube or you can listen on Apple Podcasts. Hit the subscribe button. And if you have any case suggestions, you can let me know on any of those platforms. And thanks for listening. Have a good one. This podcast has been approved by Skipper the Cat. Right, Skippy?